Hello, Houston. We're going to continue our journey through theories of psychology of personality, I should say, today, and hopefully get at least a good part of the way through looking at psychopathology of personal behavior also. Um, we had reached the point, I believe, where we were ready to start talking about the, the last major cluster or group of theories that have evolved over the years, uh, and those are what would generally be called the humanistic slash phenomenological theories. Um, to give you an idea, this group of theories starts from a completely different set of assumptions than the ones that we've looked at um, up to this point, and it evolves into a very different kind of, of theory. The central assertion, which, which is markedly different, is the following. The essential nature of personality consists in the inner experiences of the individual, the understanding of which provides freedom for action and choice that is necessary for personal satisfaction and human fulfillment. You will hear there a whole bunch of words that we haven't talked about much previously, and yet they're things that are very important to us. Things like inner experience and self-perception. Freud doesn't talk about that. Understanding of the experiences. Freedom that we gain by virtue of that understanding. And even how audacious we talk about things like personal satisfaction and fulfillment. These are all concepts that are very important to you and I as we develop personally, but they haven't really been tapped into by any of the previous theories that we've, um, that we've talked about. This one does. The one that I want to, or this group does, and the one I specifically want to talk about here is what is sometimes referred to as self-theory. Others would call it ego theory, but it clearly comes out of the ego portion of Freud's version of, of uh, how our personality um, develops. Um, and in this case, the, the guilty party, the developer, was a psychologist by the name of Carl Rogers, uh, whose work basically traces out of California and the 1960s. So where the psychoanalysts reached their pitch, reached their peak in, in the 19 aughts and 1910s and 20s, um, these people, or I should say the behaviorists, were in the, in the 30s and 40s predominantly, and, and Carl Rogers and, and those in, in the um, phenomenological group really hit their stride in the 60s, starting in California. And you'll notice a very distinct kind of California flavor to this, uh, to this theory. In essence, what he talks about in terms of the structure of the, um, of the, theory, of the personality is folded out in four forms or elements that, that are, are contributing here. The first of these is what Rogers calls the organism. The organism is basically the locus of all experience. That is essentially everything that's going on at any given time. <coughs> My cough, the, uh, the temperature of the room that you're sitting in. Now this is a little more awkward to talk about when we're dealing with it interpersonally in television because your organism is somewhat different from the one I'm facing with lights and students looking at me and so forth. You're looking at a sleepy dog in a fireplace and a television set or something like that. But in general, when you and I are in the same arena as the students in class here with me are, the organism that we share in common, the lights, the sound of people's notes changing, you know, pens scratching and so forth and so on, those are all part of our organism. That is, they are the shared experience that we have collectively. The second element, then, is the element that we isolate out of that, which Rogers refers to as the phenomenal field. The phenomenal field is essentially um, the totality of experiences that we have. According to Rogers, it has both conscious and unconscious dimensions to it. Um, but in essence, what it really is, is, is the window that opens up every morning when you awaken. It's kind of your window of observation on the world as a whole. So when we talk about phenomenal field, what we're really talking about is, is my perspective, your perspective, and so forth. That is part of, but separated from, the organism. In that, for instance, if you and I had gone to a meal, uh, gone to a, um, uh, a lunch yesterday, um, the restaurant environment where we, uh, where we ate would be an organism, that it, was, it would be shared elements of, of the total experience. But my phenomenal field, would be different from yours. That is, we, I would be looking at, um, at you, and, and you, on the other hand, would be looking at me. We would share the noise out of the kitchen, the smell in the environment, and, and the general ambiance of the situation that developed. But um, my phenomenal field would be different from yours. What eventually evolves out of that phenomenal field, by a process I'll get to here in a minute, is a self. And the self normally develops, um, is, is essentially a portion of the phenomenal field that becomes differentiated from that field. Now to give you an example or an illustration of the difference in the sensitivity of these two theories, think back to the description that I gave you when we were talking about Freud in the previous lecture 
what would Freud say was driving the situation if when you sit down at the table as a three-year-old and you reach across and grab a, a roll off the plate of your brother or sister sitting next to you? What kind of driven behavior is that? What, what part of the personality is driving that behavior according to Freud? That would be the id, yes. Okay, that's id-driven behavior. You remember, I want what I want when I want it. And there's kind of a pejorative, accusatory manner to that theory. I mean, the, the id is somehow acting out because it's, um, it's interested only in its, in its own designs and purposes here. Consider the contrast, though, because the way Rogers would analyze that kind of a situation is to suggest that what you've got there is a youngster that, who, who has developed a phenomenal field but has not yet developed a sense of self. Because by implication, as soon as you develop a sense of self, what also develops instantly at that point is not self. The whole world gets divided into me and thee, or mine and thine, as soon as we create the sense of self. What Rogers would do in looking at that kind of a, a, a scenario built around a three-year-old is basically to suggest that if that youngster reaches over and grabs a, a roll or something off a brother's plate and starts eating it, in essence, what's going on there is simply that from the perspective of that three-year-old, we're here to eat. We've eaten here before, we're going to eat here today, and we'll eat here in, in the future. And in essence, there's a big bowl in the front that's got a, several things in it that look tempting. Somebody put something on my plate, but the one that looks like this over there looks better than the one here, so I'm just going to eat that one. And in essence, it doesn't have anything to do with stealing from or, or serving only your own needs. It simply has to do with the fact that the, the phenomenal field has not yet been divided into me and everything else. And so in that sense, it makes it a much more innocuous, selfless, or, or non-selfish kind of act from the perspective of, of somebody like Carl Rogers' self or, or ego theory. Um, the fourth element of personality that develops out of the self, then, is what Rogers calls the ideal self, that which essentially the individual or person would like to be or to become. To anticipate here a little bit, psychopathology or problems of abnormal personality development are going to occur if the gulf between, the gap between self and ideal self gets to be too broad so that you can't see how to get from self to what you'd like to be. We'll talk about that more a little bit later. But in essence, um, the ideal self is what you are striving toward. The tension between self and ideal self is essentially what Rogers would argue has you here today. That is, that you've got an idealized version of what you want to be that you're not at yet. You're still some 40, 60, 80, 100 credit hours removed from it, and so you're still working toward that ideal self. Um, and those are basically the four structural components of the personality as, as uh, Rogers talks about them. When we look at the dynamics of personality, that is how the personality actually operates, the key concept for Rogers is essentially what he calls positive regard. Okay. In essence, the, the um, behavior, as he's envisioning it, is essentially goal-directed attempts of the organism to satisfy its needs as experienced in the field as perceived, using terms that we've just per per defined here earlier. And the two needs that we basically have are one for positive regard of self by others. That is, you and I don't like to be the, the object of scorn from other people. We'd rather be enjoyed or appreciated or liked by other people. And in essence, that is the instruction to parents that, that a Rogerian would offer. That is, that what we're really interested here in here is, is bathing an infant, a child, in positive regard. It's a no-no, essentially, to make love conditional. That is, you don't make positive regard conditional on the behavior of the organism, which clearly a behaviorist would be willing to do. At some level, you know that there's a cost to the fact that I'm going to like you and treat you well and, and so forth. Um, Positive regard on the part of, of Roger's perspective is essentially the fact that you are loved regardless of what you do. So the, the love is non-evaluative, or sometimes Rogerians will call it unconditional positive regard. You are loved regardless of what you do. You will see examples of that every now and then when some youngster, 20-year-old, acts up. Um, and I'm using youngster in that sense in the sense of mother-daughter or mother-son kind of relationship, when it, because a parent always views children as youngsters forever. You're 80, you're still a youngster. Um, the point is that if that one acts up and, and creates, you know, blows some older couple away or something like that, and then you see the mother interviewed on television or one of the parents, it is just a tragedy to watch them in some instances having to acknowledge that, yes, that youngster clearly screwed up, but I still love him. But that's pure Rogerian psychology, that is, that, you know, you're disappointed in them, and, and a child may in fact disappoint you. But as Rogers would point out, that's your phenomenal field versus theirs. 
And that's a different matter from whether you in fact appreciate them as individuals. So in essence, the, common reg the, the positive regard is intended ultimately to facilitate the development of self-regard. So that if you are bathed in, un in, in unconditional positive um, regard, <coughs> the net result is that, that a, a very healthy sense of, of self will develop. Um, in terms of, speaking of development, in terms of development itself, whoops, I went too fast there. Um, Rogers has essentially very little to say about, um, about development per se. He really provides no timetable for the evolution or, or occurrence of, of particular events. It's just basically that as the child matures, um, relations between the organism and the self are constantly being evaluated by the individual and the concept of self is, is being adjusted as necessary um, in terms of that. Now, that having been said, it's a fairly easy to critique. Um, it's a, and there are several negatives, basically, unfortunately. One is the fact that it's, it's very vague. It's not an easily testable theory. It doesn't immediately generate predictions that you can haul right into the laboratory and test directly as one problem. A second is that it's really a descriptive but not an analytic theory. It describes human events and human relationships, but it doesn't do a particularly good job of, of analyzing them. Thirdly, it's too focused on the here and now with relatively little, as I said, developmental perspective. It's there, it's just not well developed in the theory. Um, and finally, it ignores or really doesn't address the issue of, of whether there are unconscious determinants of, um, of behavior. That having been said then, let's take a few minutes here and look at one particular element of these theories, and that is how each of these theories deals with one of the things that you and I have to deal with in our everyday life, lives, and that is conflict. Essentially, trait theory is very easy to compare for you. Trait theory simply does not deal with conflict, period. So we're done with trait theory. Now let's look at psychodynamic theory and get ready to push a button here because I'm going to ask a question. If you think back to the way in which I described psychoanalysis, I'm going to argue that psychoanalytic theory is basically a theory which is based <coughs> in conflict. The entire theory, as I explained it, is essentially based on a conflict model or conflict resolution model of how our personality actually operates. Name for me, cite for me an example of conflict in psychoanalysis. At home, before you hear the answer, mash pause and think about this a minute. Or let it run. We've got about three minutes here of stunned silence before we get an answer. But uh, Give me an example of conflict in, in psychoanalysis as I talked about it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. Any example of conflict? Where does conflict play a role in psychoanalysis? What do you mean by in your mind? We've never talked about mind in here because I'm not sure anybody could operationalize that for me. Go ahead. Could it be like a what you want to do versus what you should do? No. Okay, what, what parts of the structure of personality are you talking about there? Because yes, that is one of the central conflicts. Want versus should. Who represents want or what part of the personality represents want? The id. The id. The id, yes. So you, what you've got there is the id versus the superego. And that is one of the central conflicts in all of psychoanalysis. If you remember, we talked about the fact of a Russian troika, not the fact, but the illustration of a Russian troika, where what Freud really wants is to have equal contributions from the id, the ego, and the superego. And in essence, the source of personal difficulties, as when we get to it, is that the ego begins to sense that it's losing control either of the id or of the superego. And what does it then do? It creates defense mechanisms. It throws up defenses to shelter it from the effects that the id is about to break loose or the superego is about to break loose. Conflict. Give me another example of conflict. In the development section of the theory, I also talked about another example of, of conflict. There are actually a couple of others buried in there. What about the movement among the stages? What causes fixation? Over or under stimulation? Like too much stimulation or not enough? Like. I think you're onto it, but the word that I would have used is pleasure or aggression, essentially. That, that if you're, as you remember, what I was saying is that when you're, according to Freud's analogy, when you're moving an army across a desert, what you're doing is moving your libido, your psychic energy, through a series of developmental stages. And fixation, which is the source of personality problems, occurs if things are either too easy for you or too difficult, too frustrating. 
Okay, so in essence, the 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 point there is that parents are advised to walk a very narrow line in raising children as they move through those stages because you want to give them enough responsibility so that they don't sense or feel that they're crimped in or frustrated, but you don't want to give them so much freedom and so much responsibility that they can't handle it, that they're not, that they're not yet skilled enough to do it. So that would be a second element. A third one that I could think of would be um, essentially the Oedipus complex, the Oedipus and Electra complex, uh, or conflict as they're sometimes described in the uh, phallic stage. Basically, youngsters have to learn to role model the same sex parent rather than rival that parent for the affections of the opposite sex parent. And that is also done on a conflict model. So psychoanalysis really is a theory about conflict. It, it, is, it is built around the concept of conflict and it deals with the kind of conflicts that we have to deal with on a, um, on a daily basis. Um, the other thing that I would simply point out here is that defense mechanisms basically are created by the ego. And we'll come back and talk about those in the psychopathology section of the, um, of the course itself. Um, in addition then, the third broad class of theory that we can talk about, we might even talk about here as behavioral rather than just social learning theories, but, but learning or environmental based theories are, the, are, are a third source of, of psycho, um, psychological illustrations of dealing with, with uh, conflict. Specifically, um, Neil Miller, who just died here in, in the spring of, of uh, 2002 um, at the age of 92, a, a great experimental psychologist, one of the best in the world, developed a very interesting theory of personality way back in the 1940s. Um, and that theory basically involves an analysis of conflict from a learning slash environmental perspective. And in essence, to do this theory, what he proposed was five different general principles. This is all anchored on, on a, a line diagram such as you can see here, a graph such as you see coming, developing on the screen here. Distance from the goal is on the x-axis and the drive level or urgency that you feel to get to that goal is reflected by the dimension on the y-axis as we'll see in a minute here. But the, the approach gradient is basically going to look like this. What he's arguing is that when you have a positive goal, something that is attracting you toward it or, or where you're being urged to approach it, has what is called a, a, an, a, a, an approach gradient attached to it, meaning essentially the closer you get to the goal, the stronger the urge that you have to get to it. Many years ago, my family and I and some friends went on a horseback trip in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It was a, about a 20-mile, well, round trip, probably almost 40 miles, but a long, day-long trip. Um, I guess it was 20. It must have been 10 out and 10 back. We were all on horses, obviously, if it's a horseback trip. The, the animal that I was riding was quite willing to let me stop and take a picture headed out. Photography is a hobby of mine. Anytime I wanted to stop and take a picture, that horse was all willing to stop and go over in the shade and drink or do whatever. Um, until we got to lunch and ate and then rode about another hour out and then turned around and came back. And as we came back, I noticed the closer we got, the later in the day it got, the harder it was to stop that horse to the point where a mile or so from the stadium, the, um, the um, stable, um, in essence, it took both hands and me pulling back as hard as I could to get that horse to stop. Um, because in essence, what it was driving, what was moving it, was an approach gradient. The sooner it got to the barn, the quicker it got me off its back and got brushed down and cooled down and fed and watered. So it had all sorts of reasons to want to get back to the barn and probably very few to keep me on its back. And so the net result was that horse was operating with a very strong approach gradient. But if you like Cokes, you can sit on the South Pole and dream of Cokes. Okay, so that the approach gradients work from a long distance away. If you're in love with somebody, you can daydream with them and, and events shared with them anywhere in the world. So the approach gradients can operate some considerable distance from the goal in, in some situations. Secondly, we have an avoidance gradient. Now an avoidance gradient is quite different from the, um, from the approach gradient. The avoidance gradient operates much closer to the, to the goal object itself. And in essence, um, those are the urges, the drives that are moving you away from the particular um, agency whatever, or goal, whatever it happens to be. So if you're a fat person on a diet, you can dream about drinking a Coke from way far away, but as you begin to get closer and closer to the Coke machine or the grocery store, all of a sudden the reasons why you're on that diet begin to occur to you, and the urges to get away from it or back away from it tend to start growing. That's the avoidance gradient, the forces driving you away from the, the goal object. The third element has to do with the differential relative slope. 
and I've essentially talked about the implications of that. But the fact that these two different curves have very different slopes associated with them is basically saying that the approach gradient operates much further out from the goal than do the avoidance gradients, which kick in only very close to the goal. Um, that having to do with relative slope. The fourth has to do with the increasing drive level. Again, I've already illustrated the point that the closer you get to the goal, the stronger are the, are the uh, drives that are associated with whatever that goal happens to be. In the instance where you have um, two different gradients operating, that is both the approach gradient and the goal gradient, this theory is predicting that conflict is going to occur at a point where the two tendencies equal each other. So we're measuring drive level here on the, on the y dimension, as I said earlier. And on the x dimension, what we're measuring is essentially how strong is the tendency on that, y, on that y dimension, located based on our distance from the goal. And relative to the point where the two tendencies cross each other, that is on this graph, what this theory would argue is that up until the point where the, where the line, where the arrow ends, the pressure is only to approach the goal. Okay? That is, you're getting, you're getting urged onward by the approach gradient. But then what happens is, as you get closer and closer to that coke or that food, whatever, what happens is the goal, the avoidance gradient, begins to kick in. And now all of a sudden, as you get very close to the goal, now all of a sudden the urge to get away from it or stay away from it is equal to the goal, the, the tendency to approach it, the gradient to approach it. Illustrating it another way, if Aunt Tilda visited you for Thanksgiving and you stuffed her full of food, you know, three servings of turkey and dressing and all the other good things that go into a Thanksgiving meal, then all of a sudden dessert rolls around and suddenly she's got principles. You know, you offer her cherry pie and it's one of these, oh, I can't, I'm on a diet, I really shouldn't eat it. Now suddenly she's got principles. So then you pull out all the guns and you say, well, I was up till 3 o'clock this morning cooking it for you, Aunt Tilda. And then she begins, well, maybe I should try, but I really, well, but I'll try a bit, but, and what you're seeing there is vacillation. That, that I'd like to, but I shouldn't, oh, I'd better, but I won't. That's essentially vacillation that we're watching in, in that situation. And that occurs when the tendency to approach exactly equals the tendency to avoid. So the avoidance gradient kicks in the closer and closer you get to the goal object, and the net result is that you're hung up some distance from the goal trying to decide whether to actually consume it or not. A very sophisticated analysis of approach avoidance um, tendencies in, in conflict. I said there would be one study that involved animals. This is it. This work was actually done by attaching strings, springs, to rats' tails and putting them in a, in a goal bog, in a, in a runway, and a food object that they could see, and then measuring how strongly they would pull, either to get to or get away from, whether it was a goal or, a, or something they were trying to avoid. So this literally was originally measured quantitatively using animals rather than uh, humans. But I think you can clearly see how easily it generalizes to, uh, to humans. Uh, Let's look at some specific examples of these types of conflict. Uh, one is an approach-approach conflict. If you see somebody um, having put money into a Coke machine and they're racked by indecision between a Coke and a, and a Sprite, um, that kind of indecision doesn't last very long. Okay? And the reason is it's an approach-approach conflict. You're standing there poising your finger between two buttons. You're not going to be there very long. We don't see people racked by indecision for hours in front of a Coke machine because it's an approach-approach conflict. Both goals really have only positive aspects associated with them, and as soon as you lean even slightly one direction, that's the direction you're going to go because there's nothing driving you back. You have only two approach gradients operating. Second possibility is an approach avoidance conflict. That's essentially a description of the one that we had on the screen a couple of minutes ago. That's an approach avoidance conflict. If you're a fat person on a diet, what we're going to see is maximum conflict or vacillation just at the point where the two tendencies equal each other. And so in this case, with this person at the table, you can see one hand reaching for the food and the other hand pushing back from the food. And in essence, that's the conflict. Which arm is going to win out um, governs how we ultimately resolve the approach avoidance conflict situation. The third possibility is an avoidance avoidance situation. We have a lot of sayings in our vocabulary related to that, if you think about it. Can you think of one that is involving a choice among two evils? Damned if you do and damned if you don't is one. What's another one? Electrocution or lethal injection. Have you stopped beating your wife? Because if he says yes, then he has been beating his wife. If he says no, then he has been beating his wife. Then he's still beating his wife, yes. 
that's, I'd have to think about that one a little longer, but yeah, I think that would qualify from the individual's perspective as an approach avoidance conflict. Which way do I do it? But I suspect what you've actually cited is a multiple approach avoidance, which I'll get to in a minute, and I'll show you why. Twixt the devil and the deep blue sea, caught between a rock and a hard place, six of one, half a dozen of the other, damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, we've got a lot of different avoidance avoidance conflicts that we actually deal with. Now let me show you what the, what the net result is of that kind of a graphic analysis. And that is that with an avoidance avoidance <coughs> conflict, what we tend to do is to assume a stable position halfway between. If you've got a chemistry exam and a physics exam and you're lousy in both of them, you don't know which not to study. And so the net result is that you will often assume a stable position about halfway between. Your roommate comes in and says there's a great movie on, you're gone, you're out of there. Not to decide is to decide often describes the solution of an avoidance avoidance conflict situation because you've got nothing driving you forward either direction. They're only driving you away from the goal objects. Finally, you have an approach avoidance conflict, okay? And what you actually described in terms of have you stopped beating your, your, your boyfriend yet? is, is an, a, a double approach avoidance conflict because if you acknowledge the one, or well let me generalize it more. If you've got two cars, both of which you love, you can't, most of us are not rich enough to say, wrap them both up, I'll take them both and decide later. By virtue of picking one, one negative of that is you don't have the other one, okay? I saw this happen one time at a subway in, in Boston. And in essence what happened, if we can go back to the, um, back to the uh, screen for just a second, I'll describe in essence what was involved here. I was going on subway from, from Cambridge near Harvard into Boston at Christmas time. In the Cambridge station, when the train comes in, most riders know that if you go to the front of the train, you're near the exit from the station for several stops afterwards. That is, the exit from the station tends to be at the front of the train. And so in essence, if you have time, normally in Cambridge, you used to walk to the front end of the train. This particular Christmas uh, season day, I was in no particular rush to get anywhere, so I was just standing near the back of the train when it came into the platform, which is where the entry gate into the, into the whole area is. So I sat down and watched. And here came a woman who weighed 320 if she weighed a pound with as many Christmas packages as any human ought to decently be able to carry, and she was just barely managing. How she got through the, the coin collector, I don't know. I didn't see that. But as she's headed toward the door of the car I'm in, which is the back car, she heads directly toward the rear door and then changes her mind and thinks, well, you know, probably thinking to herself, I've got all these packages. If I can get further up in the train, I won't have to carry them so far. So she started toward the rear door of the next car up and then changed her mind and headed back toward the rear door and then changed her mind again. She changed her mind five times before she ran into a concrete pillar, dropped the packages, the door shut, and the train left. In essence, what I was witnessing there was a movement back and forth between the two places on the diagram here where the lines cross. The rear door had the goal that she'd be on the train, but the disadvantage, she'd have to carry the packages further. The front door had the advantage she wouldn't have to carry the packages so far, but the risk that she'd lose, miss the train. And so she vacillated back and forth between those two conflict situations. That's what I think you've actually got in, uh, you know, have you stopped beating your boyfriend yet? Is, is you've got, you're choosing the lesser of two evils in that case. There is, there's a positive in both ways because, oh yes, of course I've stopped. But if you say that, then, well, that means you were before. And if you say, oh no, I haven't, implying you don't beat them, in fact, by implication, you, you obviously do. So I would say it's really a double approach avoidance that you've got in that situation. But it's a very sophisticated, interesting analysis, experimentally based, of what, um, what conflict looks like. Um, the last theory, uh, the, the humanistic theories, have not been as detailed in their, their treatment of, of um, conflict. Now, let's move ahead into, then, uh, looking at abnormal behavior. Um, that's a judgmental behavior phrase when you start talking about it being abnormal or psychopathological. And, and people even have written papers about really we shouldn't talk about this at all. Unusual perhaps is a better word to use. I will simply stick normally with either abnormal or psychopathological. One of the problems we run into immediately is the difficulty in defining what we mean by normal behavior. And because of that we have even greater difficulties defining abnormal behavior as you will see. I'm going to suggest that there are really three broad classes of definition that we could use. One is what I would call criterial definitions. These are essentially definitions that are, that are derived from some kind of a group norm. The classic example of that would be a statistical definition of normality. Um, and that we could plot on a, on a standard normal distribution. You establish a frequency distribution, you establish acceptable limits, and anything outside of that is considered to be quotes abnormal. Okay? Think about frequency of taking a shower. 
Most of us will take a shower probably once a day. Maybe in summer you do it twice a day just for your own sanity. But in essence, I'm sure you've met people uh, who will shake your hand and then rush right over to the drinking fountain to scrub their hands of any germs that you might have deposited on them. And you've probably also got friends who take a shower once a month whether they need it or not. Um, those are extremes. In fact, they're unusual, indeed, potentially abnormal extremes. But for the vast majority of us, normality is defined somewhere around a modal value of a shower a day. That's a statistical definition, however. And one of the problems we run into is, well, okay, where do you actually draw the line? Is the difference between 1.2 showers and 1.21 showers a day enough to warrant you should be hospitalized? There's clearly a problem there. A second way to define it is to define it instead in terms of the efficiency and adequacy with which you deal with your everyday life. And again, you can see the appeal to, to typical behavior in this kind of a, um, a definition. Here, we've got somebody who's hunkered down. You're coming into final exam time here at the university shortly. And every now and then we see people hunker down out in the yard, um, on the yard somewhere, just kind of leaning down, contemplating their navel in terms of whether they're going to be able to get all their papers read and all the reading done and get straight A's on, on their tests, which is, of course, the desire of everybody. That's okay. That's a period of kind of self-contemplation, which in some cases can be very helpful. But if the grounds crew reports that they've been mowing around this guy since the last August, that begins to cause us some worry. Okay, that is not somebody who is being efficient in, in dealing with their everyday life. Again, the potential lies for, for diagnosing abnormality here. Um, there are secondarily um, what we would call existential definitions. These are ones that really stress personal subjective definitions of adequate behavior. That is, in essence, we're looking to you to define whether you're healthy and happy with, with yourself. And so in essence here, the definition of, of, whoops, I'm going too fast here. Let's back up for a second. In essence, what we're talking about here is internal discomfort. If you feel discomforted by things that are happening in your life and your behavior shows it, then you probably are acting out and, and acting abnormally in some way, such that you would probably, for your own sanity, uh, want to go seek some, some help of one sort or another. The third are the, are the broadest classes of definitions, and these are what we would call the external or social definitions. You will by now already begin to sense that these are not mutually exclusive definitions, that there is some similar considerable degree of overlap in the various definitions that we can utilize here. One of the types of external or social definitions of, of behavior that is abnormal is what we would call eccentric behavior. Here at the university with 35,000 students, a faculty of 1,000, and, and a, a blue crew of some 4,000 people, there are a huge number of people here, and it's a large, multi, multi-million dollar, over half billion dollar operation. Um, and you'll find, of a Thursday morning, the lawn sprinklers run in that area of campus always. And whether it's raining or not, the lawn sprinklers are going to be running. Okay, but that's just a matter of it being a bureaucracy and, and ultimately most efficient to just dump water in a predictable, ultimately water-saving way. But if you have a neighbor who waits to water his yard until it rains, now you've got potential eccentric behavior, particularly if it's backed up by other acts of this, uh, of this type. This is also the filthiest slide that you're going to see during the course of the um, semester. If you don't understand, ask. <laughs> Secondly, we have what could be called professional definitions. Are you aware that in a number of states, if two psychiatrists declare your behavior to be a danger either to yourself or anyone else, you will be hospitalized? Are you aware of that? All it takes is two <laughs> MD psychiatrists agreeing that your behavior is dangerous in a number of states, and you will be hospitalized. Unlike the freedoms that we have when we're thrown in jail, you lose all freedoms when you're thrown into a mental hospital. And in essence, you have to prove your innocence in that situation. You have to prove your way out of there. One of my all-time favorite studies um, was um, done by a, um, a friend at Stanford, David Rosenham, who basically um, had himself admitted to a mental hospital by applying a certain number of symptoms. And then as soon as he was admitted, he had dropped the symptoms. I will describe the results of that when we get further into the description of, of uh, abnormal behavior. But it was a very interesting battle, and it took an, an average of 27 days to be released, 20, almost four weeks before he was released from the hospital, acting normal. Thirdly, we have the cultural and social definitions. That is, if I had shown up here today to lecture in a black flowing robe with a white powdered cotton wig, 
you would have thought I'd flip my wig in one way or another. Um, and yet if George Washington had showed up in the halls of Congress 200 years ago to, to um, do things, conduct business, without the white cotton powdered wig, people would have looked at him kind of goofy too. So in essence, we've also got the possibility of, of defining things culturally slash socially in terms of norms. The difficulty there is that these things are subject to change and there are wide disparities among, among what constitutes, quotes, normal behavior in a given situation than in, in several other situations. Now, basically what I want to offer up here is, is a, a practical definition of what we mean by mental health. And you'll have to pardon me if I shuffle notes here a little bit because I'm, I'm in the process of reorganizing things on the, on the fly here. But in essence, there are basically three things that go into the definition of, of normal behavior, which was advocated by Arnold Buss, um, a psychologist at the University of Texas. And his definition, I think, has pretty well withstood the test of time. If you fall short on any one of these three things that I'm going to mention here that he developed, um, you stand the, the possibility of, of being qualified as behaving abnormally. The one is essentially <coughs> discomfort. If you feel uncomfortable with your behavior, and if it shows in your personal and or your social behavior, then you probably do need help. So that would be one basis for, for defining abnormality. A second way would be to talk about the bizarreness of your behavior. If your behavior deviates in any, in, from commonly accepted standards of behavior, um, then again, you're probably behaving abnormally in, in a, a documentable way. There are two important qualifiers here. One is the fact that the behavior has to be related to your individual environment. Twenty years ago now, with the world witnessed with, with um, disbelief, I guess is the best word, what was called the Jonestown Massacre. Where, where many hundreds of, of families, men, women, and children, went to a, a coast off the, um, went to an island off the coast of, of South America, under the, the leadership of a very strong religious leader, um, who apparently had an elevator that didn't quite reach the top floor, to be euphemistic. Um, but in essence, this man gained more and more control the more absolute his authority, uh, authority was. And the net result was that, that rather than open themselves up to external examination, um, he convinced everybody to poison themselves, that is to, to uh, drink poison uh, fluids. And, and multiple hundreds of people died in, in a very short, uh, short period of time there. You can't necessarily paint all of the people in there, just like in the Branch Davidian compound, as crazy. Because in essence, once you lose control of your decision-making capabilities, even though we might question or fault the process that you went through to decide to go there originally, once you're in that environment, your behavior is not necessarily crazy because you don't have the freedoms that most of us thankfully enjoy in this country. And the other thing is that the discomfort has to cause personal discomfort. That is, the bizarre behavior has to cause personal discomfort, really to qualify as bizarre in, in terms of Buss's definition. And the third element then is the, is the inefficiency that we were talking about earlier. If you demonstrate an inability to, to function properly in a role that you have self-selected, that's another basis for assuming uh, potential abnormality. Now, when we look at abnormality itself, it has been the subject of an amazing variety of, of misconceptions, perhaps is the best way to put it. One is the idea that, that behavior, abnormal behavior, is necessarily bizarre, okay? Um, the difficulty here is that, that most, the public's general understanding of abnormal behavior, unfortunately, is often tied to either fictional or popular presentations of what that behavior actually looks like. For instance, in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that movie, that show, actually has one of the best depictions of abnormal, typical psychiatric ward scenes that I've ever seen depicted. And they did a very good job of it. But even still, when you're reading the book, it's simply Ken Kesey's version of abnormal behavior that you're being treated to in that, um, in that situation. Um, but the actions of the, of, the, of the patients there, in one scenario in the text, were so good that the patients were able to commandeer a bus within the state hospital, you know, fence surrounded grounds, get themselves out of the hospital, get to the sea, rent a boat, and get out on the high seas before their leader, one of the inmates, stopped paying attention to them, and then things began to fall apart. But they had acted normal by normal detective standards um, up to the point where they were out on the high seas. So there just really is not a, a um, it's not always the case that people who are abnormal are in fact behaving in a bizarre manner. A related misconception is the idea that normal and abnormal behavior are somehow documentably different from one another. They are not. There is at best a gray or fuzzy border between the two. Perhaps nowhere better indicated than by that normal distribution definition of, of 
normality that I was talking about before. And that is, it's, it's strictly a judgmental value when you draw the line and say, okay, anything more extreme than that is abnormal. That's a value judgment, pure and simple. And it's not always easy to make that call. And any given behavior, given context, may be quite easy to actually explain or, or rationalize. So it is not that they are documentably different in every instance by any means. A third is the idea that somehow former mental patients are unpredictable and dangerous and always need to be treated with suspicion and, and caution. Not so. David Rosenhan, as I was describing a couple minutes ago, a tenured full professor of psychology and law at Stanford University. I don't know how good their law school is, but their psychology department has repeatedly in the last 20 years been rated as the tops in the country. I mean, it's a preeminent department. Um, one of their faculty members puts himself in a mental hospital by going in complaining of, of hearing voices at night and having a pain in his elbow. And as soon as he gets in there, he stops complaining and then starts taking notes. So he was engaging in what sociologists would call participant observation. That is, he was taking notes to keep a record of how he was dealt with and while he was in the hospital. In one instance, a, a nurse right in front of him simply unbuttoned her blouse about halfway down to readjust her bra strap and then buttoned it back up again in a way that you would never see go on out in the real world. But it was just, you know, there was a, a distancing factor of staff versus uh, patients there that, that Rosenhan really nailed quite effectively. But the interesting thing was, that you know the first people who actually detected that he was not desirous of being in there, that he, was, that he, was, that he didn't actually belong in there? The patients themselves, yes. They were the first ones to actually detect that he was behaving, quotes, normally, that he wasn't one of them. And the net result was it took something like 27 or 28 days on average across the eight or 10 hospitals in which he tried this. And he wrote an excellent report on it that I would commend to you back in, in 1973 called On Being Sane in Insane Places. And it's just a magnificent analysis of what it takes to get out of a mental hospital. And the reason I burden you with that is simply to point out that less than 1% of those who are released from a mental hospital are actually dangerous. And the unfortunate part is, here's where the popular press I don't think serves as well. If a former mental patient goes off the deep end, as any of us may at any given time, one of the things that is always advertised is former mental patient, you know, and then whatever the atrocity was that was performed. But statistically, if you look at former mental patients who act up and get arrested, the proportion is actually lower than for the proportion of you and I, everyday people on the street, who act up and get arrested in one way or another. So actually, they are, by normal comparison, safer rather than, uh, rather than less safe. Another rumor is the idea that the mentally ill should somehow be ashamed. Uh, you go to a dentist to get your teeth fixed, you go to a, a physician to get your, your medical problems fixed, and so forth. Um, why is it that ne such negative affect is associated with getting emotional and, and behavioral problems uh, solved? Change is occurring, but it has been extraordinarily slow. And I, I would point out to you, for instance, uh, Missouri Senator Thomas Eagleton um, was, was nominated for the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket in 1972. After the convention, it was revealed that he had submitted himself to a mental hospital a couple of times for uh, treatment for nervous exhaustion and, and depression. My understanding was that at one point in a very short period of time in his life, he lost a brother, a father, and, and a close friend to, in accident situations and was, as you might expect, somewhat depressed. And he admitted himself, self-admitted himself to get help with kind of sorting things out and getting back on track. The newspapers got a hold of that and just had a heyday with it. And the net result was that for the good of the party, uh, he resigned from the ticket. Um, but I would cite to you as a counterexample of what it takes to be vice president, I'll mention one other name, Dan Quayle, who could not, if you remember, even spell the plural of potatoes when asked in the first grade by a student how to do so. So that I would suggest that our definition of abnormality uh, is sometimes a little more extreme than it really ought to be in terms of what constitutes acceptable, um, acceptable behavior. Um, one of the, the um, things that we might then end up starting to worry about is our own foibles and, and um, our vulnerability in given situations. Um, and in order to talk about that, could I borrow your book for just a second? Um, I want to put something on the, on the overhead screen here. Um, to show you um, a curve that we're actually going to um, have a look at here. Thanks. And in essence, it's this one. If we can go to the overhead camera and just put this curve on it, on the corner of the simple psych book. This was so complex, I didn't have time to uh, develop a nice fancy um, 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 graph to describe what's actually going on in this um, 
in this situation. But in essence, what we've got here is a graph which shows two different things. The dark part of the graph, the, the bars that climb and then drop, is the patients that are in state and county mental hospitals. And the lighter graph, the lighter bars, are reflecting U.S. population in this particular um, situation. And the, the basic uh, problem that we've got there is that um, there has been a huge shift in the, in the nature of, of mental disorders, as we're going to talk about it here um, shortly. But the, the point is, essentially, that, that the proportion of us who need to be hospitalized for mental disorders is, is very much on the decline at this point. Um, and so the idea that we are, are um, you know, that there's something that we really need to be um, uh, massively ashamed of is, is not something that we really need to, um, that we really need to, um, to worry about at this point. So in terms of our own foibles and, and vulnerability, um, it's non-existent. It's not non-existent, but statistically the odds of, of uh, needing to be hospitalized are remarkably small. There was a report about 30 years ago, even, that asked essentially, have you ever, it, it was a national survey of people, asked, um, have you ever felt you were going to have a nervous breakdown? And as many as 20%, about one in five of all of us, answered yes to that particular question. So it isn't that we don't worry about it. But the fact is that something less than one half of 1% of the total population is actually hospitalized. It's, it's in serious decline for reasons that will develop here um, before too much longer. The other thing related to this that I wanted to comment on, and I started to expand into it a couple of minutes ago, but let me just fill out in a little more detail what I was talking about here. And that is that when you have moral decisions to be made, who are the experts that you normally go to to make moral kinds of decisions? Well, wouldn't it be something like parents or ministers or, or things like that? That kind of expert is, is the one that you go to in that situation. If it's a social adjustment kind of situation, a legal issue or, or something like that, you're going to go to a judge or, or a lawyer or somebody like that. If you've got a physical adjustment, a medical problem where survival is the goal, then obviously you go to a physician. All of those are publicly sanctioned and licensed authority figures except parents. And I, there are days when I think we ought to be licensing those too. Um, but in essence, um, that kind of a, a, a situation is those are all publicly sanctioned authority figures. And I, just, I guess I question why it is that when pleasure is the life goal, why there is such negative affect associated with going to a psychologist. Because we really tend to sweep that under the rug. We don't tend to tell friends when we're going to see a, um, a psychologist. And I think to a certain extent that's just a, a value situation that people are still kind of coming to grips with um, um, what the essence of, of consulting a psychologist really is. Finally then, what is our actual susceptibility to, to, um, to mental illness? Um, and the answer there is, is basically relatively small. Um, let me now look into another problem that might lead you into thinking you're going to have a mental illness and clear that up for you also. Um, I had a friend who was in medical school. Uh, who was reading about a condition called Bella's syndrome. Now, Bella's syndrome is a condition that shows up as a trembling of the hand. It is most likely to show up in that way. And he noticed as he was reading that the book seemed to be uh, kind of trembling uh, a great deal. Um, and the, plint, the print was getting uh, rather blurry in that, um, in that situation. Um, so the net result was, in that case, that, that um, he got worried about it, but he plunged onward. He kept reading on the thought that he might actually be able to, to get through the condition. And so next what he did was to, um, was to read about something called Ursula's complex. Now, Ursula's complex is a skin condition showing up as chigger-like scratchable spots, especially on the upper chest. And as he was reading about that, his chest began to get kind of creepy crawl, and he began to feel more and more as if he needed to treat it. So at this point, he's got two complementary conditions. He's got a hand that trembles and a chest that needs scratching. So if he holds his hand in just the right place, he can kill two birds with one stone. So scratching his chest, he read onward. He read thirdly then about lung infarction, which is a collapsing of the lungs. And as he looked at this chest of his, which was getting deeper and deeper and redder and redder the more he scratched, he realized that it seemed to be hunching in. And he got worried about the fact that he had a lung infarction, which in turn brought on a fourth condition called latent melancholy, which was a condition of, of depression brought on by worrying too much about the other conditions. And the net result then is that he's gotten himself convinced that he's ill, seriously ill. I'm going to suggest that we analyze that by forming the acronym of the first letter of each of those four conditions and say the likelihood he's ill can be summarized by bull. What he's actually exhibiting there is what's called the medical student syndrome. If you think you're sick, 
go get a professional analysis. Do not self-analyze. He who has himself as a psychologist has only a fool for a client.